Good morning to those who are joining us uh, this Sunday, May 7th, from the Smith Cove Baptist Church for the live stream of the message today. It speaks of debt. And that's a term that's familiar with all too many people who are in debt. And when we think of being in debt, we think of finances, but that's not the debt we're talking about today. Scripture readings are from, it's a parable from Luke chapter 7, and then a single verse from Paul's letter to, to Timothy. But first, from Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 43. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a simple life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, and so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him, at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured the perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 5,000 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I, replied, I suppose the one who had the larger debt forgiven. And Jesus says, you have judged correctly. And then from Paul's letter, his first letter to Timothy, his protege, his protege he says here in, in verse 15 from chapter 1, here is a trustworthy saying that is, deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you write your word and your message upon our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I should have mentioned at the beginning of the service this morning is the first Sunday of the month here, and we celebrate at the Lord's table. So if you're taking in the the live stream from home or wherever you may be, if you have a little something to eat, a little something to drink, that you can join in in that portion of the service. The requirement, there's not so much for rules that we have here at church. The thing is, it's Jesus' invitation to you that if you believe that Jesus Christ has died for your sins, that he is resurrected from the grave, then this is your invitation. So, the message I had put together a devotional for a group of people many years ago and somehow I knew that after the devotional was delivered that it needed to be converted into a Sunday message. Well, I was kind of short on time for a Sunday message today and well, I feel that this sermon is at least meant for me and after you've heard it, after the Holy Spirit touches you with God's word, maybe you'll find that the, the sermon is for you as well. And it's it's a message about the trap of of self-righteousness. It's about grace. It's about God's word and us paying attention to it. Of course, that should be something that we would have every Sunday. The message is about all these things, but it's also about the struggling Christian who, who continues to fail. It's also about the lost person who feels that they are too far gone to receive God's salvation. So I'm going to present to you the devotional that I had prepared and to see as you listen, if you find yourself in the shoes of, of some of the characters that are, that are in it from the scriptures and from the devotional, there's the Apostle Paul, there's Simon the Pharisee, there's the sinful woman who anointed Jesus. But rather than dealing with the scriptures in the order that I shared them, I want to first just look again at 1 Timothy 1. Verse 15, the apostle saying, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, whom I am the worst. There's some key words here. Trustworthy. Full acceptance. Full attention. Listen up. 
The word of God is trustworthy. We must accept it fully. And God's word is holy. And not only holy, but true. God's word is alive. It is active. There's prophecy unfolding before our very eyes. God's word is changing lives. It's responsible for changing the lives of most of the people, or maybe all, hopefully, that are listening this morning. God had given the apostle Paul the word. He gave Paul understanding, and, and actually we glean from the New Testament, he gave Paul special revelation. Paul says, I know what I'm saying is to be true. And he's saying to his protege, he's saying to us, accept it fully. Things to accept, to know, and to believe that Jesus came to save. He came to save sinners. God's word, which is Jesus in the flesh, came to save sinners. The New Testament teaches that Jesus is God. He came in the flesh to teach us. He came in the spirit to convict us of our sins. Jesus fulfills the law, and upon our acceptance of Jesus, we receive his Holy Spirit. Continuing on in the theology, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, convicts each of us. He shows us, each of us, that we are sinners. And Paul says that Jesus came to save sinners of which I am, Paul said, the worst. The worst. Paul didn't sin against God or he didn't persecute the church like he used to by the time he was writing this. Paul had received salvation. His sins had been forgiven. But even Paul didn't ever forget that he was or he felt that he was the worst of sinners. Paul's memory of his sin wouldn't, would, wouldn't allow him to forget. It would constantly remind him of the grace that God had poured out upon him. Now, we may not sin like Paul did. We may not be the worst of sinners, but we are still sinners. Breaking one command, the Lord tells us, is like breaking them all. So we need to be careful that we don't let ourselves feel too holy or become self-righteous. God forgives us of our sins, but our memory, our God-given gift, by the way, it doesn't allow us to forget our sins. And I believe that there's a reason for that. That being that we need to remember quite often just how far we had fallen before we found Christ. We need to remember or we could imagine ourselves as the worst of sinners. Because in doing so, this keeps fresh in our hearts and our minds the grace, the grace of God that has been poured out upon us as well. We need to remember this when we are tempted to judge others. As we judge other Christians. Or even those who haven't found salvation yet. There is but one judge and it's not you and I. Jesus had told Simon the Pharisee and, and Luke. About two men that owed money to a money, a money lender. One owed a lot of money. The other a little. This part of the story in Luke is a parable. And Jesus, uh, Jesus asked Simon, you know, of these two, which of these two who were in debt loved the money lender more? Well, it doesn't take a lot of common sense to, to think and feel that the Pharisee he answered the one who had the larger debt. Of course, he would love the money lender more. So far, the Pharisee understood. But he wasn't seeing the point. Those who are struggling from the deepest ditches of sin. It's often seen, it's often witnessed that when those, the worst of sinners, finally grasp the grace of God, they may well recognize and truly love God more as God has forgiven them more. Some Christians who have been, you know, cleaned up pretty good, maybe have forgotten the debt that they owed. And to be safe, each of us could consider themselves the worst of sinners all the while that we're aware of God's grace keeping us from judging others now in short that was the devotional it's a reminder that though we are forgiven 
we also continue to sin. And much of the time when we sin, we do it willfully. There is unknown sin in our lives. But overall, we have a debt. A huge debt that we can never repay. And the debt of our sin keeps renewing itself daily. You want to call that interest or whatever you want to call it. The debt just doesn't seem to go away. It keeps happening. But the grace of God is also there that forgives us of these sins. There's a whole other sermon about, well, this doesn't give us a license to sin, but the fact still remains that as we continue to sin, it should tell us something about our condition, that we are in constant need of Jesus and his sacrifice. If we have in mind, you know, some particular Christian, maybe a well-known or, or popular one of the past or, or currently, you know, the holiest of Christians that we can have in our mind, they still have a debt load. Some folks forget the sinful things of the past. They may say, I'm not like that any longer. I'm better than I was before. Better. By whose standards? One might be better off being saved instead of lost, but better. A Christian better than some other Christian? Or a Christian better than someone who hasn't received Christ? I don't believe that's possible. Not in God's eyes. We're not taught that God plays favorites. God will work in and through those who seek him. And he will work with those who seek him more and more earnestly. But each of us are sinners and we keep sinning. Yet God still loves us all, the lost and the saved. I think we lose touch of this. We have no right to condemn anyone else. We have no authority. You're not to say you're not as good as me or my sin is less than yours. It almost sounds like what we witness on TV with politicians. They say that they, they don't do what the other party does, but as soon as they're voted in, they end up doing what the other party was doing. If we rewind a little bit from the passage from Luke chapter 7, first we have Jesus, God in the flesh. And he's being anointed by a known sinful woman at this self-righteous Pharisee's house. Obviously, she's sinful. We don't know for certain in this section of scripture what her sin was. It doesn't say, but she was sinful enough that it was known by Simon the Pharisee. But Jesus, sinless, holy, and the only one that was qualified to judge this woman, what does he do? He doesn't judge her, but he takes more notice of the Pharisees' judgment of her. The woman is sinful, but she is still willing to serve the Lord. And then she gets judged for her being who she is, a sinner but not by Jesus. It's the Pharisee who is also sinful. He sees himself better than her. He sees himself closer to God than her. And this is not the first time that Jesus explains this in scriptures. We have other times where sin is actually going on and Jesus is looking at those who are in judgment. Why is it that the religious of the world do this? Often it's more time spending on this, looking at the sins of others rather than looking at inward at our own sin. The woman had remorse. She could recognize that she was a sinner. She anointed Jesus' feet. She anointed them with her tears. She used this expensive perfume. She used her hair to dry his feet. Who of us would do such a thing these days? And the Pharisee, on the other hand, just looked at all of this in amazement. She's a sinner. How dare she be this close to the prophet? If he was a prophet, he'd know who this woman was. Yes, a prophet. The Pharisee wasn't even seeing Jesus as a savior, but maybe a prophet. The church is the place for sinners. 
but all too often the lost are made to feel that they have to be sinless before they can attend or they have to be all cleaned up before they would ever enter the doors. I truly believe that that's not the case here. I can't speak for everyone. Decades of Christians being judged when it's not our job to judge. I believe it's driven a lot of needy people away from church or maybe even from salvation. It's making God's love more difficult to see and experience or to accept. Of course, yes, this woman in, in the story, in Luke, she is sinful. She recognizes her sin. And it was in, she was in tears over it. When was the last time we were in tears regarding our sin? The woman owed a debt that she couldn't pay. The Pharisee, on the other hand, had figured that he was good enough. He was thinking that his debt was at the very least much smaller than hers. She's a sinner. He's the righteous one. So as that story unfolds, we, we can say that, yes, maybe the Pharisee did sin less than this woman. But that didn't give him any right to judge her as he did. It looks like the Pharisee had already forgotten the parable that Jesus shared with him moments ago about who loved that money lender more once the debts were forgiven. Again, quickly to make the point that Jesus made to the Pharisee, the one who owes the most and has that debt forgiven, that debt is canceled. That person is more thankful, more aware of what has been done for them. They are apt to be more intent on serving God because of the debt load that they owed. The one who owes little or feels that they sin less than those of others, those worst sinners out there. Well, they often tend to fail to see their own sin or to see that sin is sin. Let's look at some of the other characters. The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul had a sin debt larger than any of us, I suspect. This is the same man as he was earlier found in the New Testament. He was having Christians tortured, arrested, imprisoned, sometimes killed. But Jesus got a hold of him and changed his life. Jesus showed Paul the sinfulness and Paul spent the rest of his life serving God through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus who had saved his soul. And in that reading from 1 Timothy, Jesus, Paul says, has come into the world to save sinners. And I'm the worst one. That's how the Apostle Paul looked at it. Paul acknowledged his sin. And once Paul had been forgiven of his past sinful life, he continued serving Jesus Christ, the one who had freed him from that sin debt. Now, there's no doubt that Paul still sinned. But Paul didn't let, let that past debt or his current debt stop him from serving God as best he could. So what's our problem? Do we think so highly of ourselves that we are better than others? I, I sure hope not. So the problem? Do we feel that we can't be used by God for his good and perfect will because of the sins of our past? Those sins, as you've sought forgiveness through Christ, those sins are forgiven. Forgotten by God. It's only Satan or others in our own minds that keeps these past sins in our minds to drag us down, making us weak and defeated much of the time. What's our problem? Do we still have sin in our lives today so that we feel that we can't be used by God? That's nonsense. So as we draw closer to God, and he chips away, he sands away the sinfulness that he wants taken out of our lives. Does it all get removed? 
Well, he is the potter. Let him have thine own way. But he is the potter. We are the clay. We're never going to be sinless until we enter the gates of heaven. So if we're waiting to be perfect, we're wasting valuable time. Because we're not going to be perfect here. So rather than dwelling on the sins of the past or the sins of the present day, not to belittle them, but having these keep us from seeking God or seeking his will in our lives, we must acknowledge the sin and ask for forgiveness. Knowing the debt and that we've been totally freed from this, this should spark something in us. It should have an effect on us, a positive effect where we can close our eyes and whether it's physically possible or not to, to be on our knees. Thanking God, praising him that I'm forgiven. I'm saved. I'm debt free. So what is it that you want me to do, God? How can I serve you, Lord? How can you and I bring glory to God for being thankful for wiping out our individual sin debts, for loving us even though we are sinners? And if we will think for a moment like the Apostle Paul that we owe the largest debt. And as we think of ourselves as the Apostle Paul, the worst of sinners who has been forgiven, recall that God used Paul he can use you. He uses me. Amen? Okay, a few are awake. That's good. We're meeting at the Lord's table this morning, as I mentioned earlier in the message. And in keeping with that, with what I just said about sinners being with Jesus, think of the different versions or the different accounts, <coughs> excuse me, the different accounts of the Last Supper, the night before Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus, in one account, washes the, the feet of the disciples. He did that as an example because he was their master. But one last time he was showing them to be a servant. He shared the Passover meal with all of them, all the while knowing one was going to betray him, one was going to deny him three times before the night was over, and that before the night was over, all of the disciples would disown him and, and flee. Yet Jesus died for them. He continued the course of his life, his purpose for them, for you, for me. Can I ask the servers to come forward in preparation for our meeting at the Lord's table? Let us pray. We praise you, Lord God, that you have forgiven us of our sin debt. Lord, we don't want to be weighted down with guilt so that we become feeling like we're useless or how could we or how could I do anything because of my sin. Lord, remind us through your spirit that the sacrifice that you have made. And as we take in this 
this sacrifice and, and what it means around your table, Lord. Why was it accomplished? It was because of our sin debt. And as we're reminded of this, Lord, just because of our natural memory, may we also recall, as big as our sin debt was or is, your grace and your love, your blood, is more powerful and cleans us whiter than snow. We thank you, Lord, for the table provided for us, for the body and blood of Christ. May we seek your forgiveness, Lord, of our sins, our sin debt, and commune with you in this part of the service. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would the servers please serve? In Jesus' wisdom, he took ordinary bread of his day. Jesus had already taught the disciples that he was the bread of life, that we needed to consume him in a symbolic way, feeding upon Jesus that we may live. He allowed his body to be broken, and he's using the bread that he breaks apart and, and gives to each of his disciples. This is what we are accomplishing here this morning, or sharing in the body of Christ. Debbie, would you give thanks for the body and the bread? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this good day. I thank you more for the beauty of your love for us. That, Lord, you would be down on the cross for us, that we have done. And, Father, I am so thankful for this gift. Father, I thank you for the broken body.
And in the same way Jesus had shared the cup with his disciples. And I just remembered I didn't share the scriptures this morning. You can be at this at a long time and you still don't get it right. Most of us would be familiar that Jesus broke the bread and passed the cup. He said this is the blood of the new covenant. This cup represents that. A new covenant that would be for the forgiveness of sins of many, he said. Jesus' blood represented in the cup, washing away our sins, his holy and perfect sacrifice. Dorothy, would you give thanks for the cup and the blood of Jesus Christ? Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Prophetic in nature, Jesus says, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. The body of Christ, the bread of life, eat of it and live. The cup representing the blood of Jesus Christ, his life poured out for us that we may live. Drink it and give thanks. When they had finished the meal, it was written that they went out to the Mount of Olives. They sung a hymn and they went out to Mount of Olives. Let's, let's stand as we sing the first verse of Bless Be the Ties and Bind. Come Father, we thank you, Lord, for the fellowship we have with one another, but especially with you through your Holy Spirit. We ask, Lord, a blessing on each one here, each family that's represented who are listening this morning. Bless our loved ones, our families, our friends, near and far, Lord. Protect us. Guide us in ways that are truly pleasing to you and all of God's children's sake. Amen. Blessings on you all, and don't forget, keep washing your hands.